All right, a word about our uh, speaker today. If you were to uh, look in the bulletin, you'll see the uh, title of our message today. It says, God's Sovereignty in Nature, Human Affairs, and Salvation, a Surgeon's Perspective. From time to time, it's nice to get a perspective that comes from a different angle. And in this case, we are hearing the angle that comes from a, uh, a surgeon. And the surgeon is Dr. Hal Walters, <coughs> who is a pediatric heart surgeon at Children's Hospital in Detroit. And so this is somebody who, um, well, someone has pointed out to me, he apparently knows how to operate on hearts in more than one way. Um, operate on hearts in the sense of being able to do that in a physical sense, but also to share from the Word of God. I know from experience that Dr. Walters loves God's Word and memorizes God's Word, studies God's Word, and finds in the Word of God precious truths. And also, as somebody who has the kind of eye you would expect of a doctor and a scientist, the eye that can see what God has done in creation. And isn't that wonderful to be able to say, this is what God has done in creating these things, and it gives us a window on what he has done. And then, of course, a man like this has also had many experiences in life that shows what God's character is and who he is. And so I asked uh, Dr. Walters if he would come and share a little bit with us from the Word of God, perhaps a little tiny bit from his experience, his observation of nature around. And so all of that is what we're prepared to be hearing today. In the uh, back of your bulletin, you've got some of the sermon notes that even mention some of the scriptures that he'll be referring to as we go along, and I think we're going to be looking at a variety of places. So I'm going to ask Dr. Walters if you might just come right on up forward to the uh, podium here and begin in any way you wish, and um, we're all ready to hear from you. Okay. Uh, before we pray... I've got a strong voice. Before we pray, can you hear me all right? Um, I'd like to first go to scripture. And uh, my text for today is um, the story of, of Joseph, whose brothers sold him into slavery and into Egypt. And he rose to a, to a position of great power and authority, such that uh, when the great famine came over the land, he actually saved his family from famine. And this uh, passage begins where Joseph's uh, brothers meet him, realize who he is, and are afraid that he's going to exact revenge on them for what he's done. And Joseph says to them, do not fear, for, I'm in the place, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So I'd like to, for you to remember that small phrase, but God meant it for good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, these words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable to you. And I pray these things in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. It's a privilege to be invited to speak to you all. I don't get to do this often. I don't think I have done this but once before, so you'll have to bear with me. But it's something that I've always wanted to do, and I'm very grateful for the invitation. I take this opportunity every bit as seriously as I do when I'm doing heart surgery on children. When I do heart surgery on children, I hope that I'm doing something good for their physical hearts, but I take this no less seriously that today I'm speaking to you, to your, to your uh, spiritual hearts. And, um, and for me, that's a great privilege and a real responsibility as well. Today I want to talk to you about God's sovereignty, and especially as it relates to nature, as it relates to human affairs, and as it relates to salvation. And I also want to give you some insight as to how this might intersect with my profession as a pediatric heart surgeon, share with you maybe a, a story from our 
my life with Catherine, my wife, and the impact that this story has had on us and the way we view God's sovereignty, and also draw some practical points along the way. But before I start, I'd like for, to tell you what I'd like to, for you to remember today at the very outset, so that if you forget everything I've said, maybe you could just remember this one thing and believe it with all your heart, that God is in control of all creation and every single aspect of your life, and that this sovereignty that God is working out in your life, this control that he has, is always associated, ultimately, with a purpose. It's purposeful. It has a meaning in your life. In my line of work, if there's a hole in the heart, I close it. If there's a blockage, blood flow from the heart to the lungs, I try to unblock it. If the two great vessels that come out of the heart are switched and connected to the wrong chambers, I try to switch them back. If a baby has one ventricle instead of two ventricles, they may need three operations in order to cope with that situation. Many times parents are asking me questions. I've, I've had it this week, I had it last week, I hear it every week. How is it possible that my baby has this heart defect? What's responsible for this heart defect? They always want to know, did I do something wrong? Where will my baby be functionally after all of these surgeries? Will they be able to act like other babies, play, walk? When will all these operations end? Or will my baby need operations for the rest of his life? Or even the hardest question that I have to answer is, why did my baby die after heart surgery? Thankfully, about 98% of the time, the outcome is good but about 2% of the time, that's what I face. There are other situations as well that are not only difficult for the families, but are difficult for the surgeons and for the staff and everyone who takes care of the baby. For example, in the recent past, I operated on a baby who had hypoplastic left heart syndrome. This is the most difficult thing that we have to operate on. It's the most difficult operation. The baby was doing well. We had plenty of indication that uh, the, the pictures of the surgery, everything looked great. The, we rounded on the baby in the morning, looked fine. Five minutes later, we were in another baby's room and that baby's heart just stopped beating. We started CPR. We worked for two or three hours. We eventually got the baby on a form of artificial heart and lung support but it didn't do any good. Baby died. These things happen. They're, they're difficult for me to understand. And if they're difficult for me to understand, you, you just couldn't even begin to imagine how difficult they are for the parents to understand. God's sovereignty is, though, I think one of the pillars of our faith, and it touches every aspect of our life and of creation. As a matter of fact, if you come here today as a follower of Jesus Christ, that's an example of God's sovereignty in your life, a great gift. There's nothing on heaven and earth that isn't affected by a sovereignty. After all, who is God? I don't think I could possibly begin to define him, but one of the best descriptions of God that I've ever seen is he is that above which there is nothing greater. So if God is really God, then doesn't he have to be sovereign? And if he isn't sovereign, I don't think he's God. So what do we mean by God's sovereignty? Well, we mean that he's supreme. We mean that he's in charge. What he says goes. He rules, and we mean simply that God is God. Perhaps one of the best definitions of sovereignty that I found in preparing for this talk is to say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the Almighty. He's the possessor of all power in heaven 
and in earth. None can defeat his counsels. None can thwart his purpose. None can resist his will. Now before I go on, I want to set a few ground rules. First of all, this is a difficult subject and I'm not going to do, do this perfectly. It's a broad subject. There are literally thousands of biblical references. I had to pick just a few, probably pick too many as a matter of fact, but you can't look at scripture. I, I defy you to look at a page of scripture and not come away with some indication of God's sovereignty. It's a sensitive subject, though, and one must never presume to trivialize the trials and sufferings of other people. And furthermore, I don't think that one must ever presume to, know, to say that one knows what God's purpose is always in the trials and sufferings of other people, and I'm not here to tell you that I do. And the perspective that I'd like for us to take is that because God is sovereign, we need to be careful about bringing our preconceived ideas to this discussion. We have to remember who we are in comparison to God. We're, we're small. We're finite. We're limited. But he is huge. He's infinite. He's unlimited. <clears throat> As such, our perspective is a very puny, small perspective. And when we study this, we have to know what the Bible says about it. Now these Bible verses, I'm going to be going through a few of them. And so just to make it a little bit easier for you, if you'd like to follow on the slides, that's fine. If you want to follow in your Bible, then get your fingers ready. We're going to start with the 46th chapter of Isaiah in the ninth verse, where God says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I, will, I have purposed, and I will do it. So let's go back to the beginning of this passage where he says, For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Now this is the uniqueness of God that is at issue here. God is saying that he is one of a kind. This is essentially a statement about the godness of God. In this passage, <clears throat> I think God feels he needs to say, now look, I'm God, and you are not acting like I'm God. Or, or, or maybe there is no other, and you're not acting like there is no other. I'm the only God. Now, in ver the beginning of verse 10, he says, I declare how things are going to turn out before they happen. Now, here, he's not necessarily talking about his sovereignty, but he's talking about his foreknowledge. And that's true. He does know the future. But also notice that in the last half of the verse, he says, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. So not only does he know the future, but God has the freedom, he has the wisdom, and the authority to bring that future about. So yes, he foreknows, he also has a plan, and he intends to accomplish his plan. And the reason God knows the future is because it's him who plans the future. He plans the future, and he accomplishes the future. Someone said that the future is the purpose of God being accomplished by God. If you look at verse 11, it says, I have spoken... I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. The reason God makes predictions is because he knows, he runs and he accomplishes the future. He has a purpose for it and he does it. Whatever comes about, another way to look at it is to say that whatever comes about, he intended for it to come about. 
Everything that happens, is happening, will happen, and has happened has been purposed by God. Now this is sometimes a little difficult to reconcile because there are many very tragic things that happen in the world. But we have to remember the truth that God is sinless, that God does not cause us to sin, that because he's God, he's sovereign, and therefore his sovereignty has to be perfectly compatible with our moral responsibility as humans. But I want scripture to talk for itself. So first we're going to consider sovereignty in nature. Let's just take Proverbs 16:33. It says, the lot is cast in the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Now, what's another way to say that in modern language? Another way to say it is, you roll the dice, but it's God who determines what number comes up, not chance. You play Monopoly, but it's God who determines who gets Park Place. Sounds a little trivial, but God is a God of details. There's nothing too unimportant for God and for his control. And we'll see that in the next verse. Matthew 10, 29, where it says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. This is God's way of saying that there is no detail too small for his control, whether it's a bird that falls from the tree or whether it's knowing the number of hairs on your head. I think it was either R.C. Sproul or John Piper who said that there is not a single maverick molecule in the universe, and I believe that. And if that applies to molecules, then it applies to neutrons, protons, electrons, and any other on that you want. Let's go to the 40th chapter of Isaiah, where God says, lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Indeed, God, by his word, created the universe. He spoke, and it came from nothing. And he also created the laws of the universe, the, the laws of physics that we, that we can study in science. But I don't believe that he created the universe, established those laws, wound it up, set it running, and then stepped back and let nature randomly take it away and run it according to its own course or according to some, some chance or, or uh, thing over which he doesn't control. But if God controls the trillions of stars in the universe, if he knows those, if he's named all of those, then can't we say that he controls the weather? that he controls disasters, that he controls disease that I deal with, and that he even controls death. Look at Psalm 147, 15th verse. It says, he sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down his crystals of ice crumbs who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them, and he makes his wind blow and the waters flow. This is kind of a, a poetic passage here, but I think it's a statement of fact also that God does send the wind. God does send the snow. He sends the sun. He's in control of every one of these things, and when he sends the wind, he has a purpose for it. And we also know from the Gospel of Mark or where the, the disciples are in the boat with Jesus and the boat is about to be upset and they're frightened to death and they wake him up and he says, peace, be still. And they were amazed because he can also stop the wind. And if he brings the wind, he brings it for a purpose. If he stops the wind, he stops it for a purpose. 
And if he doesn't stop the wind, he doesn't stop it for a purpose. Let's go to Exodus, the fourth chapter, 11th verse. It says, Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now this strikes close to what I do. I believe that it is God who ordains that some have disease and disability, and I don't want you to take this in the wrong way. I'm not saying that because God ordains this that it's easy or simple. It isn't. Life isn't easy, much less a disability or a disease. It isn't. But look at what God says to those, though, who suffer according to God's will. In 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verse 19, where he encourages us in our sufferings to entrust our souls to him. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. What he's saying is, if you're suffering, trust me. You may not know what's causing this right now. You may not know now what the purpose is, but trust me. Stay with me. Don't go away from me. In the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy, in the third, 39th verse, it says, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. If I wake up this morning, it's because God wanted me to wake up this morning and to live and to work and to serve him and to do his will. If on my way to church I'm hit, killed by a drunk driver, then that was God's will to take me home to him. If the Lord wills, then we live. If he doesn't, then we go home. So before I go to a practical uh, example of this in my life, I just want to summarize by saying God is sovereign in the small things like the letters in Scrabble, the following of a bird, the crawling of a worm, in bigger things like the movement of the stars, the falling of rain, the blowing of wind. He's sovereign in disease, the loss of sight, congenital heart disease. He's sovereign in our sufferings. And finally, he's sovereign whether we live or whether we die. And all of these are included in that passage that we began with in this 46th chapter of Isaiah that said, but I will accomplish my purpose. These things that God does are not random. They're always ultimately tied to his purpose in our life. So I just want to share with you a couple, uh, well, one example of, uh, of a... Uh, something that I feel that God um, is sovereign in our lives. I don't believe it was chance that I was born with a recessive gene for a disease called hypophosphatasia. It's a disease that I is less than 100,000 births. I went to medical school. I never even studied it. I didn't even know what it was. Nor do I think it was chance that my wife also has a recessive gene for hypophosphatasia and that God in his sovereignty brought us together to be husband and wife. And um, I guess where I want to pick this up is uh, in 1989 when our son Stephen was born. I was training for heart surgery at the University of Alabama. It was a time when I needed to decide whether I was going to become a children's heart surgeon or an adult heart surgeon. So it was a very formative part time in my training. Now when I faced, when, when Catherine and I faced this, we had already been through the loss of our first daughter, uh, Mary, who had died in England from the same disease. But this is something that, uh, that I wrote 
at that time and which I've had a chance to reflect upon over the years since 1989. But I have to say I need to thank my mother-in-law who found this for me when I was uh, preparing this sermon. So bear with me, I'm just going to read what I wrote 24 years ago. Seventeen weeks after my conception, mom and dad found out that I was, according to God's perfect plan, affected with a serious disease. This is from Stephen's viewpoint. My older sister, Mary, who now lives in heaven with Jesus, used to be affected by the same disease, but now she has a perfect form. Mom and dad were both sad about my illness, but they knew how faithful God had been to them in the past, and they had no reason to suspect that he would be any less faithful in the future. Mom and I established a close bond of love during the months I spent inside her womb. Dad wasn't around a whole lot because he was at the hospital, but when he was at home, he would feel for any movements and listen to see if he could hear my heartbeat. But moving inside the womb wasn't easy for me because of my illness, and Dad's stethoscope just didn't seem to be sense enough to p sensitive enough to pick up my heartbeat very well. One day I had a dream while I was still inside my mom. I dreamed that I was trying to walk through a beautiful field, but because of my illness I was having trouble. I was frustrated and called to God for help, and he answered me, saying, My dear, precious child, your frame was not hidden from me, for I created your inmost being. I am knitting you together in your mother's womb. Despite your physical limitations, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. After that, it never seemed so important to me to ask for God's why, but rather to ask how I might serve him best. More and more, I began to think, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. You hem me in behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. As the time for my arrival drew near, I began to give mom subtle hints so that she'd have time to prepare. We communicated very well despite the obvious limitations. I noticed that my parents, who until that time were fairly relaxed, began to feel more tense. Once I heard them talking in bed. Mom was crying. Dad was nauseated. They were holding each other, and both of them were feeling the same thing. You see, they realized that as long as I was in the womb, I was safe and protected. They also knew that once I was born, I wouldn't be able to cope physically with the outside world. There were many tears shed during this time. I guess my mom and dad are just like everybody else. They don't like to let go. I don't know why grandmom and granddad decided to come only 14 hours before I was born. The Holy Spirit must have been guiding their decision because there was no definite warning. But it's a good, a good thing they came because here's what happened. The day I was born, mom was feeling frequent pressure sensations, but they didn't produce much discomfort. We all went out ate at Burger King, went to the merry-go-round for Hannah. In retrospect, I guess I should have pressed on Mom more forcefully to let her know I was coming soon, but I didn't want to hurt her. <laughs> we went home to bed. Dad showered, combed his hair so that he would be ready for anything. At 12, 12 a.m. on December 3rd, I finally pushed hard enough to get her undivided attention. So what did she do? She took a shower and then woke up dad and called the doctor and put on his clothes. By now the, the contractions were regular, but just as we were about to leave the house, mom got a strong urge to push. I didn't want to rush her, but after all, I knew this was God's timing and what he says goes. From then on, everybody shifted into high gear and the race was on. Dad made granddad dive, drive the car in his pajamas. Dad sat in the back seat trying to keep mom from pushing. About halfway to the hospital, the car ran out of gas and stalled. There were no problems. There were two Homewood policemen whom God had parked 10 yards away. They were only too happy to give us a rapid ride to the hospital, but not until dad managed to twist his knee trying to hustle mom out of the car into the patrol car. 
we left Granddad to tend our car in, in his pajamas. <laughs> we reached the hospital in record time, and the nurses directed Mom rapidly to the nearest room. By the time she got onto the bed, I had already poked out one of my legs. I thought you were supposed to tackle things feet first, but nobody else seemed to agree with me in this case. They kept saying something about breach, whatever that is. Oh well, it was too late by then. Our doctor was on his way, but there was nothing that could stop me now. Dad, of all people, put on a pair of gloves and delivered me himself. My heart was beating slowly. My breathing wasn't good. All of this was expected. And there was nothing, medically speaking, that could be done to correct the underlying problem. But I was comfortable. I was wrapped in warm blankets. I was being held closely by Mom and Dad. Hannah gave me a hug and a kiss and even helped Mom comb my hair and clean me. As my heartbeat continued to fade, they all had tears in their eyes. I'm not sure why, I saw heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. I saw my sister, Mary, my Aunt Helen, my great-grandmother, Cave, and Dada waiting for me with open arms. I can't describe the warmth that I felt and the beauty that I saw. Along with loss comes grief, but we all have a sure hope when we put our trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. Although you grieve, Hold fast to that hope, and remember that all is well. Well, as I said, I've had 24 years to reflect upon that experience, and Catherine and I had had four or five years in between the birth of Mary and Stephen uh, to reflect on that also. And I think that God was uh, trying to say, I don't want you to go into adult heart surgery. I want you to go into children's heart surgery. I don't want you to approach these people as someone who hasn't felt the pain of having a child who was born with a problem. I want you to operate on these children from the heart, not just in a physical way. And when you have to tell them that you didn't succeed, I want you to know what it feels like. Now these things are different for every person, and I can't say that this is necessarily what Catherine did. Catherine's not a heart surgeon, and everybody who's involved is affected in a different way. Hannah, Catherine, Grace, me, grandparents, my parents. But that's how it affected me, and as I look back, that's what God's sovereignty in my life through that experience looks like. So what about God's sovereignty in human affairs? Well, let's look at the second chapter of Daniel, the 21st verse. It says, he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. And what I think this means is that God is the one who ultimately sets into place those who are elected to public office. This is one of the meanings. And if you want to take away something practical from this, if you want to pray for our elected officials, then pray that they realize that it was God and his sovereignty that set them where they are. Pray that they realize that God is sovereign and not them. Pray that they realize that because God is sovereign, they should seek his will. One last verse on sovereignty as it relates to human affairs. Let's look at Psalm 33, verse 10. It says, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. But the counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. Just think about maybe Herod, Pontius Pilate, and the people who testified against Jesus. Think of the, the greatest sin of crucifying the Son of God. Was, was this situation out of God's control at that time? 
I think we're going to see in the next passage that it wasn't out of God's control. And in the very moment of their greatest sin, God actually destroyed the power of sin in our lives. And God, through that, won a great victory. Well, how about salvation? Just related to the previous verse, if we look at the fourth chapter of Acts, the 27th verse, it says, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand in your hand had predestined to take place. Now here it is spelled out that in God's sovereignty, he had even planned and predestined the death of his own son to die on the cross for our sins. And without that sovereign plan, we wouldn't have a chance. We would be hopeless. We would be helpless. We would not have been saved. So our very salvation was secured by the sovereignty of God. As a matter of fact, in these next two verses, say John 6, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And all things have been handed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So it's God's sovereign plan. He literally draws us to himself, and his Son chooses to reveal the Father to us through his sovereign plan. But my favorite verse for the sovereignty of God and salvation is Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. And this is going to be the last verse that we're going to consider, set of verses that we're going to consider. And it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now what is man's natural state? We heard earlier Pastor Paul talk to us about by nature we are born into sin. We're dead in our sins. And any of us who have seen death on a regular basis know that death is a state of, other, of utter helplessness. Those who are dead cannot in any way, shape, or form, help themselves. It's a hopeless and fatal illness. Sin is a hopeless and fatal illness without any human remedy. Reminds me, that there are some cardiac defects that we can fix with surgery, but there are others, for example, diseases of the heart muscle for which there just isn't any good surgery. And under those circumstances, what we have to do is remove the patient's heart and put in a new heart. It's called a heart transplant. Well, let's look at the first part of that passage in Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. And you know what the gift of God is for us? It's a heart transplant. That's what it is. He actually comes in. He removes our old sinful heart that holds us in bondage, and he gives us a new heart. And what does he do after that? After that, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God is the great creator. In Genesis 1, we hear that he created the heavens and the earth, and he does the same thing in salvation. When he gives us a new heart, we are a new creation. We are a new being in him. We are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus. And then we can bring spiritually good works to the equation. Not before, only after. And all of these things he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in summary, 
God is sovereign in nature. He's sovereign in human affairs. He's sovereign in everything. In salvation. I think you've heard the analogy of our lives being a tapestry. And I think it's a good analogy. It's beautiful because it's created by him. It's purpose-filled because it's foreordained by him. Our lives are intentional because they are directed by him. And we, as fellow believers, are intertwined. And we are intertwined because God orchestrates our lives together like a symphony. Now look at this. This is the back of a tapestry. Looks like a tangled mess. I can tell you that this is exactly what I felt like in 1985 when I received a phone call when I was in the operating room in England and it was a physician telling me that Catherine's, that our baby, uh, that Catherine had had her ultrasound and Mary, our first baby, was affected with a rare disease called hypophosphatasia. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to do. I was confused. I couldn't make anything out of it. I was a tangled mess. I was just like this back of the tapestry that you see. And that's the front of the same tapestry. That's what God sees when he brings these trials into our lives. He knows the beginning from the end. It's he who, who ordains the future. He knows what his purposes are in her life, in our life. And he will work his purpose out in our life. And what he asks from us is to trust him. But I guess when you get home and if you think this is worth talking about at the lunch table, one thing you might want to talk about is list, like I've had to do as I prepared for this talk, the things in your life that you think are examples of God's sovereignty in your life. Maybe talk about them and see if there are some of them for which you can see God's purpose. And then even if there are some that are very difficult, still very confusing, for which you don't see his purpose, I would encourage you to just list them all. And if you can, try to tick it off as Joseph did and say, God means it for good. God means it for good. God means it for good. Three conclusions. God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't change his mind. Let's not think in terms of chance. Let's not think as Christians in terms of luck or accidents. God doesn't act capriciously. He never takes one of us a minute before or a minute after he wants to take us home. A word about sorrow, because this is a sensitive subject. The Bible does not say, do not sorrow. The Bible asks us rather to, not to sorrow as others do who have no hope. Grief, Sorrow, doubts, questions, all of these things can open the door for God to work in our lives. And finally, a few conclusions about death. Physical death is a reality. It's a shocking, sobering reality. It's permanent. It's irreversible. And I don't want you to think that because God is sovereign, that the work is done, and that there's nothing for us to do. To the contrary, God is the only one who knows his eternal purposes. We don't know, and God chooses to work through us to share the life-giving message of salvation through Jesus Christ with others. Rather, God's sovereignty is not a formula for complacency. It is a call to urgency, the urgency of spreading the gospel. And that's what I'd like to leave you with. If you don't mind, maybe we could pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that 
you are truly God and that as true God and the one and only God, you are sovereign over everything. You are the creator. You control every aspect of your creation. You control every aspect of our lives. And in your gracious love, you provided a way out of sin and death for us into a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that. And we ask you, Lord, that you would give us hearts of praise for the acts of sovereignty in our lives that give us joy. And when you bring trial and suffering into our lives, we pray, Lord, that if with it we presently do not have understanding, that you would help us to trust you. And Lord, we are bold to pray, though, that if over time you choose to reveal some of your purpose in our lives through the trials and sufferings that you bring, we ask that you would do that. But Lord, in the meantime, we wait on your timing. We thank you for your blessings in our life. And most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who's given us hope in this life. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.